Good morning. Just for the record, I wasn't muted. I didn't mute myself like I had been doing the first couple weeks of the live stream. We had a microphone problem and uh, we got it fixed, but we are glad that you are with us. Thankful for your patience with us as well this morning. I don't know if you knew this or not, but Thursday was the Feast of the Ascension in the Christian calendar. And so as we continue into Eastertide, as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, we kind of follow his journey that the scriptures provide us after his resurrection. And so in Acts 1, as we'll read this morning, Jesus ascends to heaven. He goes to sit at the right hand of the Father. And this is a very important, if not neglected, and perhaps sometimes misunderstood part of the Christian faith. When we ask the question, where is Jesus now? What is he up to? And why is it important for us? The Ascension answers all of those very important questions. If you have a Bible, open up with me to the book of Acts. Acts 1 is where we'll be this morning. I invite you to open up with me to read along. Maybe open up on your phone or app if you'd like. Acts 1, we'll read verses 1 through 11. This is Luke writing, inspired by the Spirit, and he says, In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach, until the day when he was taken up, and after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen, he presented himself alive to them, after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during forty days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. Verse 6, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, Why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. And here we have the story of the ascension. And if we're honest, I think many of us find Jesus' ascension, at least initially, to be somewhat disappointing. We have some sense of grief and sorrow that Jesus is not here with us, physically present among us. As a pastor, I can only imagine how much easier it would be to lead a church as kind of the under-shepherd of the church if we had the shepherd, if Jesus was here. If online church, if we could all just stream Jesus preaching every Sunday because he had his set up somewhere he was giving the sermon, you could perhaps ask these questions. How much easier would you imagine the Christian life to be if Jesus were here with us physically? if we could listen to his teachings, if he could come and perform healings in our midst. Perhaps we imagine it'd be easier to follow him. It'd be easier to obey him. It'd be easier to be a faithful disciple of Jesus. Evangelism perhaps would be easier. Apologetics, explaining our faith to others would perhaps be easier. I think the question for many of us when it comes to Jesus' ascension to the Father's right hand is, what is God up to? And is this indeed a kind of a bad strategy for God? Would not the, the story of redemption have played out a little easier if Jesus had stayed here with us? It's almost as if we had our best player substituted out of the game just as it got intense. Jesus is incarnate, the Son of God. He lives and teaches, performs these miracles. He's crucified. He's resurrected. And then the disciples are privy to this crash course on the kingdom of God which had to have been just an amazing course to audit as Jesus 
speaks and teaches to them about this before he departs from them. But the scriptures are fairly unified in describing Jesus' ascension in terms of good news. That's kind of the climax of God's work in Jesus. So even though sometimes we neglect or don't think about the ascension of Jesus, if you were to look at the sermons that the apostles preached in the books of Acts, they often climax in not just Jesus' resurrection, but in his ascension. Part of the good news is that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father right now. The book of Hebrews, the encouragement it gives to the saints to endure and persevere, is built upon the ascension. The book of Hebrews is a long sermon, a a theology built upon the truth and comfort of Jesus' ascension to the Father. Jesus himself in the Gospel of John says, it'll be better for you if I leave. And so this morning I want to ask these questions What is the meaning of Jesus' ascension? What is Jesus up to right now? And why is that good news for you and for me? In the text, as Jesus ascends up into heaven, these two angels appear to give instructions to the disciples. And they say, this Jesus that was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way. It's important to recognize that the Jesus who ascends to heaven, the resurrected Jesus, is the same Jesus. It's the same Jesus as the one who came out of the womb of Mary, who we celebrate with Christmas. It's the same Jesus who gave the Sermon on the Mount. It's the same Jesus who told his disciples to take up their cross and follow me. It's the same Jesus who was crucified. It's the same Jesus who now is resurrected. The crucified Jesus is the risen Jesus. The ascended Jesus is the crucified Jesus. We've always got to be careful of any theology that tries to bifurcate Jesus, that that kind of assumes maybe implicitly that there are kind of two versions of Jesus, a pre-resurrection Jesus and a post-resurrection Jesus. One of the things we'll talk about in our upcoming Revelation series is how often we read Revelation and we imagine it to be describing a Jesus that is wholly unfamiliar, doesn't look or talk or seem or act anything like the Jesus we find in the Gospels. And whenever we encounter something like that, we've got to, we've got to step back and take a second and say, no, Jesus is the same. The risen one is the crucified one. The ascended one is the incarnate one. The ascension is a reminder to you and I that Jesus is still alive today. The incarnation, the Son of God becoming a human being, It's something that happened in time, but it's something that has an eternal consequence. We often, I think, imagine Jesus ascending up into heaven and kind of shaking off his humanity, like the snake of a skin and kind of molting out of it. But the truth is, the scriptures declare that Jesus is still incarnate, the glorified, resurrected one, as human as he ever was human. Is the one who went to the Father. The the good news of the resurrection is Jesus is just as alive today as he's ever been in history. And the ascension reinforces that truth. Jesus ascends to the Father, not just to disappear or go away from us, but in order to perform some very important roles in which the Father has sent him, in which the Father has planned. When we read the story of the ascension, There are a couple echoes of Old Testament texts. Daniel 7 is echoed, and Exodus 19 is echoed. And Daniel 7 is kind of God's perspective on the Messiah who will come and will reign, will be the king. In Exodus 19, we have the story of Moses going up on the mountain, being hidden by the clouds, speaking to God, and and serving as kind of the high priest. And both of these echoes point us towards the roles Jesus is still performing today as the ascended one. Jesus at the Father's right hand is reigning, ruling over all of creation, continuing to bring his kingdom to earth as it is in heaven. Jesus at the Father's right hand is also serving as our great high priest, interceding on our behalf, holding in his very person our identity as God's beloved, as those who are forgiven and brought into God's family. 
One metaphor I like to use to try to understand the resurrection and ascension is to look at kind of how politics and the presidential campaign in particular works in the United States. And so what happens is we have this vote every four years and and a candidate is announced as the winner. And then some time passes and they are inaugurated into office. They kind of move into the Oval Office, if you will. And this, I think, is a great way of understanding Jesus' resurrection and his ascension. Romans 1 tells us that when Jesus was resurrected, and in one way, God was declaring to the world that this is the Son of God. The resurrection or the election results. This is the Messiah. This is the victorious one. This is my Son sent for your salvation. And the ascension is the inauguration of Jesus as king. It's him moving into the Oval Office. And just as a president, when they move into the Oval Office, doesn't disappear from our life, doesn't become less important for us, but instead begins to enact their agenda, their policies. So this is the case with Jesus. As Jesus ascends to the Father's right hand, the question for us should be, what is his agenda? What is on his action item list? What are his desires, his policies for his creation, for his people? And this, again, is where we're helped to remember that this Jesus is the same Jesus that we read about in the Gospels, so the disciples encountered in the Gospels. When we ask ourselves, what is Jesus' agenda for the world? It's pretty clear in the Gospels what his agenda is. It's to bring healing to creation, to bring light to places where there is darkness, to bring God's presence close to those who feel absent or have been kicked out of God's community. Jesus comes to break free those who are enslaved. And individually, Jesus has very specific and very clear agendas, hopes and desires for you and I. What does the ascended Jesus want from us today, want from us this week? Well, he wants us to seek God's kingdom first, his righteousness. He wants us to love our enemies to bring reconciliation and forgiveness and peace. When Jesus ascends to the Father's right hand, it has much more to do with him assuming the role God has laid out for him in the grand scheme of history as the one who will destroy all of God's enemies, death being the last one, until he finally delivers over God's kingdom to the Father himself. So the ascended Christ is the reigning Christ, Likewise, Jesus, as the ascended one, is serving as our high priest. He is the mediator between God and his people. He holds the key to our identity as those who have been freed and forgiven, those who have been called to follow him on his way. We're told in the book of Hebrews that Jesus, he holds open the door to worship. He prays on our behalf, interceding for us, inviting us into the relationship that he has with the Father. This is what Jesus is up to right now. I saw a description of the ascension just a few days ago as the church holiday for those who are more familiar with God's absence than his presence. And a part of that resonated with me. On another level, though, I wanted to push back in a bit and and say that the ascension is not really just about God's absence as much as it's about his work. It's, it's a completion, if you will, of the good news of Jesus. Just as the cross is a vital part of God's work in Christ to bring salvation, just as the resurrection is a vital part of God's work in Christ to bring salvation, so too is the ascension. Without the ascended Jesus, we do not get to enjoy the completed works of of God's salvation. How does this ascension, though, fit into the work of salvation? How is it part of the gospel? Why is it truly good news for us? Well, if we were to look through the various parts of what Jesus does, even though everything Jesus does kind of stands together as a whole, you can separate things out and kind of see what Jesus is accomplishing through the things he does. In America, particularly in Protestant churches, we are cross people. Uh, We kind of focus on the cross, sometimes to the neglect of the resurrection, oftentimes to the neglect of the ascension. And I have nothing wrong with the cross. In fact, at one point in my life, I decided to kind of get it permanently put on my arm. And so I'm all about the cross and being a cross person. And when we ask ourselves, what role does the cross play in God's economy of healing and new creation and salvation? 
we might think about how you and I are sinners, how we are guilty and enslaved to sin, and how Christ's death on the cross for us pays that consequence, the punishment, offers us forgiveness and freedom. And so we need to be cross people as God's children, forgiven and freed. When we ask what the resurrection accomplishes on our part, we see another problem that we've had as human beings that's solved by Jesus. Just as we were guilty of sin and needed to be forgiven, so we were enslaved to death and needed to be brought into life. You know, being forgiven means very little if we're not alive to enjoy that forgiveness. And Christ's resurrection promises for us this new creation, that we too will live forever, that death itself has been defeated. And so just as we're called to be cross people, we're called to be resurrection people, alive and unafraid of death. Likewise, the ascension. The problem that the ascension addresses for human beings is our separation from God. Being forgiven and being alive, likewise, mean very little if we're not in the right place with the right people, with the right person. What Jesus does in his ascension is he brings humanity perfectly back into the Father's presence. This is a a problem humanity has had since the very beginning of creation. Right after the creation story in Genesis, in Genesis 3, we're told that because of our sin, we experience a separation from God the Father. We were kicked out of the garden, and all of our history has been lived since then east of Eden, separated in a sense from the Father, not experiencing the intimacy that was designed for us. And with the ascension, Jesus brings humanity back into the Father's presence. On our behalf, in his own person, he presents us to the Father. And his work of reign, kingly reign, of high priestly intercession, we find ourselves welcomed back, able to experience and enjoy the intimacy with God that that we were designed to have from the very beginning of creation. Jesus ascends so that we may ascend with him. This is the good news of ascension. This is why it's such a vital part of salvation, the climax, if you will, of God's work in Christ for us. It's a comfort and an encouragement to you and I as we do our best to be creative yet faithful to the way of Jesus, to the call of Jesus, to bear witness to the kingdom and the resurrection in our world we are able to be reminded that we are with Christ in the heavenlies. Colossians 3 gives us this very encouragement and and tells us to, to remember that you and I, united to Christ, are seated with him in heaven. That's where our true identity, our true purpose is found. And this is true because of Jesus' work in Acts chapter 1 here, Jesus' ascension. Now the disciples in verse 10 were told, We're kind of caught gazing up. One of the reasons the ascension challenges us as Christians, I think, is because it pushes us to the brink of our language. It's hard for us to imagine Jesus still as incarnate in heaven at the Father's right hand. It's also hard for us to really imagine what exactly heaven is. Um, I think we're, we're mistaken if we think Jesus in Acts is the first kind of space traveler of history. As, as if he's going up into the atmosphere and, and then you can start to see like flames starting to come as he's going through various layers in the atmosphere. Heaven is not a, a GPS location in our space and time universe. There's no map you could get that you could get on the right rocket ship with Elon Musk or with NASA and then eventually make your way to heaven. It's, it's simply a different type of place, God's dwelling place. Now, that's hard for us to imagine, even harder for us to verbalize. And yet, this is what happens when Jesus goes into heaven. And yet, the disciples, after Jesus hidden from them in the clouds, they're caught looking up. And I think it is the case that religious people often still get caught looking up. Get caught focusing, perhaps, on the wrong things. Christians, I think, have been known for being overly focused on the afterlife and not as focused on the present. God's desire to work and move and heal and free right now in our world. Christians, I think, have sometimes overemphasized God's concern for the spiritual to the neglect of God's concern for the material and the physical, for the real physical needs of our world and the people who inhabit it. 
Sometimes religious people don't get caught looking up, but get caught looking in, kind of navel-gazing at themselves. And the ascension reminds us, the angels in this story remind us to instead be looking out, to be asking ourselves the questions, what is Jesus up to? What is Jesus calling us to do as his people and as his community? How can we join with Christ in worship and in prayer? How can we both enjoy the relationship with the Father that's been made available to us, as well as share that relationship with other people. Every time we gather as a church, even if we're gathering online or virtually, we're invited to come together around a table to participate in communion with one another. And the act of communion symbolizes kind of both of the tensions of the ascension. The fact that Jesus is not here present physically with us yet, and the truth that Jesus is present with us through the Holy Spirit and the church, through the sacraments. And as we come to the table, we're reminded of Jesus' presence to us in the breaking of bread, in the work of the Holy Spirit, in the scriptures. And yet we're also reminded of our future. When Jesus returns, when Jesus takes us to be perfectly at the Father's side as well, making all things new again, descending with Christ to the Father. And so in just a moment, we will invite you to participate in communion. And on this Sunday, in which the church globally is thinking about and remembering and celebrating the ascension of Jesus, I invite you to hold both of these truths in your hearts. That Jesus comes to us present, even though he is ascended, and that Jesus' ascension performs these beautiful and vital works of God on our behalf. Would you pray with me? Risen and ascended Christ, you surround us with witnesses and send us the counselor, your Holy Spirit, who opens our minds to understand your teaching. Bless us with such grace that our lives may become a witness of your grace and power. Guide us in the path of discipleship so that, As you have blessed us, we may be a blessing for others, bringing the promise of the kingdom near by our words and deeds. Amen.